schemes of the new government did seem to work. Help was provided for subsistence agriculture. The forest industry was developed. And the fishery was converted to fresh frozen, for which there was a bigger market. Social programs that had been so desperately needed were also put into play. Things like free and compulsory education for all school-aged children. And a system of cottage hospitals that offered medical services to outport residents. But it was the imminent war in Europe that signaled real relief for Newfoundland. That relief began in 1936 with a strategically positioned airport being built at the site now known as Gander. And when England declared war on Germany in 1939, the increased demand for Newfoundland products like iron ore, newsprint, and fish led to unprecedented prosperity. As the war continued, three United States military bases at Stephenville, Pleasantville, and Argentia provided employment to 20,000 Newfoundlanders. When the war ended, the question of the country's future administration was raised again. Quite simply, there were three choices. A continuation of the commission government, which very few supported. A return to self-government. Or a third option, confederation with Canada. An assembly was formed to investigate this third proposal. One member of that assembly was a popular radio commentator and journalist by the name of Joseph Roberts Smallwood. Smallwood returned from the assembly firm in his belief that Confederation was best for Newfoundland. But for many, the issue was not that simple. And I think it's, it became so very emotional because to a lot of people it meant that their uh, nationhood was in fact under threat. By the 1940s, I think Newfoundland had really developed a distinct society, a distinct character. Um, there had been very widespread hostility to, to Confederation for, for many years. And particularly in the east of the, of the island, people thought of themselves as uh, Newfoundlanders who were sort of oriented to an Atlantic economy rather than as continental North Americans. But, of course, on the other side, there were those who looked at uh, Newfoundland's past and who said, well, look, we were not very well served by independence. Look at the depression, look at the political scandals, look at the commission of government. In other words, our past isn't a glorious past. It's a past of sort of poverty and of hardship, and we have to escape that through confederation. In the end, it was Smallwood's enthusiasm that would win out. On July 22, 1948, just over 52% of the people put their faith in union with Canada. On March 31, 1949, Newfoundland became its 10th province. With Joe Smallwood at the helm, Newfoundland headed into a new era. It seemed as if her economic problems had been solved. In Labrador, the Iron Ore Company of Canada had just been established, and mining was underway. Just a few years later, the huge hydroelectric potential was being developed on the mighty Churchill Fall. On the island, Smallwood poured millions into new industries. Develop or perish, he said. Smallwood believed the only way to secure Newfoundland's future was to get people out of their fishing boats and into factories. He experimented with every type of venture, from electronics to a cement plant to a chocolate factory. He encouraged people to move from tiny communities into larger centers. His resettlement programs of the 50s and 60s even provided money to help folks make the transition. But old habits die hard in Newfoundland. In 1957, when unemployment insurance was extended to include fishermen, new life was breathed into the industry. In recent years, however, 
we've come to realize that we can't rely on the sea forever. And so we continue to seek new opportunities and to develop new resources. But Newfoundland's greatest resource is not found in the rocky soil here, nor in the sea around us. Newfoundland's greatest resource has always been her people, determined to survive against the odds. Today, that legacy is something Newfoundlanders are proud of. For if there's one thing these people share more than anything else, it's a strong sense of their history. And it seems no matter where they live, they carry with them a profound appreciation of their home. A home that's taken 500 years to build.